let's give God some praise in here today. Let's give our children and our youth a hand. It's truly a blessing to be in the house of God one more time. The song says, Great is your mercy towards me. Your loving kindness towards me. Your tender mercies I see day after day forever faithful towards me and you always provide I did for me great is your mercy towards me great is your grace oh great is your mercy towards tender mercies I see day after day forever faithful towards me and you're always providing for me Y'all might not hear me this morning. I'll sing by myself if I have to. Said great is your mercy. Great is your mercy. Said great is your mercy. I said great is your mercy. Said great is your mercy. Said great is your mercy. For myself, I know it for myself that God's mercy, great is your mercy, great is your mercy. If that's your testimony today, say great, 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 great is your mercy toward me, your loving kindness. could have been sick I may be sick but God I'm here I say thank you God I'm here I say thank you said a fire was in my house but I'm still here today for that mercy thank you 
for your mercy thank you I may be laid off with no job to my name but in this place I say thank you I say thank you if that's your testimony say thank you I say thank you don't talk to me talk to God say thank you 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 great is your mercy great is your mercy towards me I'm gonna let you praise on that one there When I look back over my life, I say, great is your mercy. I say, great is your mercy. I say, great is your mercy. God, great is your mercy. I should have been dead. I should have been dead. But I'm here and I'm a testimony. Great is your mercy. Great is your mercy, great is your mercy, great is your mercy, oh, 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 great is your mercy towards me, your loving kindness towards me your tender mercy I see day after day Come on, give God some praise. Come on, if God's done something for you this week, if you can say that his mercies are great, if you can say that his grace is great, if he's done nothing but give you breath in your body, keep blood running warm in your rain, come on, you can give God some praise. You still got movement in your limbs, still cloaked in your right mind. You've got somebody sitting right next to you. If God's done anything for you, if he's made a way out of nowhere, if he's been faithful to you, I said, if he's been faithful to you, you can give God some praise. Let us bow. God, you are great. And your mercies are bountiful. And God, your grace is sufficient. And for that, every mouth in this church says thank you. But God, as your servant comes to break the bread of life, hide me behind your cross. God, you know Willie, so move him out the way. God, you know Willie, so decrease him right now. Magnify your power, your might, your spirit within me right now. Make me a broken vessel for you. Humble me, O oh God. Let them see your face and not me. God, there is a word from heaven. 
So God, right now, we're just going to give you all the glory. God, we're going to give you all the praise. God, we're not going to just thank you for this moment and for moments to come, but God, we're going to thank you for our yesterdays that brought us to this point. So God, hide me behind your cross. Guide my mind. Guide my ways. God, guide all my actions. And we will be so grateful to give you all the glory. So may the words of all of our mouths and meditations of all of our hearts, please let them be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, you are our strength. And God, right now we know that you are still our redeemer. In the precious name of your son Jesus, the risen Christ, we do pray. Amen. Amen. If you can just open your Bibles with me to the book of Galatians. And before we do that, if you could hold your Bibles up as our pastor does every morning, Sunday morning, and say, this is my Bible, and this is my guide to living. This is my Bible, and this is my guide to living. Galatians, the sixth chapter, and I'm going to be short and sweet this morning, so the ninth verse, Galatians, the sixth chapter, and the ninth verse. you can stand with me in the reading of the reverence of God's word. Galatians 6 and 9. If you got your app and your iPads, you should be there by now. But I'm going to give my page flippers a little more time. Galatians 6 and 9. And it reads as follows. Let us not become weary in doing good. At the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I'm going to read it one more time for your hearing. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You may be seated in the house of God. If I can preach, share with you from the topic this morning, I, I will preach it's on the way. It's on the way. My brothers and sisters, uh, this past week I got a chance to do something that I have not done in about a six months time. I watch daytime television. <laughs> and if you ever get a chance to watch daytime television, you come to realize that there are a plethora of talk shows, reruns of the 90s, and current reality shows. Stick in some Food Network and some ESPN, and that's about it. However, as I watched television, it seemed that everyone had an expert that had created a plan that would aid a person in losing weight. Now granted, this came as no surprise to me, being that over one-third of the American adult population is obese, according to the Journal of American Medicine. 
And recent studies from the Center of Disease Control identifies non-Hispanic blacks as having the highest age-adjusted rates of obesity in America. That's us. In 2008 alone, Reverend Brown, over $147 billion was spent in treatments for those who were dealing with ailments pertaining to the sickness caused by obesity. Even our First Lady Michelle Obama has made it her platform to curtail the epidemic of obesity in this country by focusing on youth health with her Let's Move campaign. So it made sense that people would have put their efforts to engage in a market of bettering health. From diets to books to Bikram yoga, these methods span the tide, my brothers and sisters. And one of the more popular among my age group is this program called Herbalife. Herbalife, look it up when you get home, which is sparked a workout spirit in the young professional scene and athletic circles across the country. Now, Herbalife's goal is to provide nutrition and weight management products to promote a healthy lifestyle. And I must say that they have been pretty successful. But what, what I am more intrigued by, uh, Pastor, is not their success stories or the success stories of any other diet mechanism. But what I am intrigued by are the people who are not satisfied by their results. And what's most interesting about those people who are dissatisfied is that their complaints many times come from things that the system would consider their own faults. Whereas they either backslid on the diet or the workout or their complaints would come about because the results didn't come fast enough. Amen, Lys. However, uh, both cases resulted in people doubting their goals and many gave up on the mission altogether. Yet what many of these people didn't realize was that diets are like any other process. They take time. And if a process is truly good, uh, it expects your failure as a necessary framework for the foundations for you to prepare to move forward. And isn't that how it is on this Christian journey, my brothers and sisters, where we find ourselves in the processes of our lives reaching towards our goals and sometimes we backslide and we fall in route to accomplishing our ambitions. Isn't that how it is, my brothers and sisters, where it feels that we are stagnant and the things that we are reaching for will never come to pass, but I came by here to preach to somebody and to encourage you on this Sunday morning that we still serve a God that doesn't just provide herbal life, but provides eternal life. We, we, we still serve a God whose program regimen is still able to deliver blessings beyond all that we can think or imagine. We still serve a God that can keep you up when you feel like giving it all up. But you've got to know that it's on the way. Can I preach it how God gave it this morning? That's what we see here in this sixth chapter of Galatians, where the Pauline voice is inclining this community to put their faith and reliance in God and not in man. Uh, Paul, Paul is pushing in this short letter the renewal of a perspective because humanity did not understand that there was nothing that we could do within our own power that could help us save us from ourselves. That, that, that only came through the grace that was given through Jesus Christ. See, this Galatians text, which has been hard to date, is suggested to be dated around the year 49 to 52. It's revered by scholars as one of Paul's greatest works because he redefines the boundaries in which one is to allow institutions, customs, and laws to get into in between their relationship with God. What Paul was trying to get the community at Galatia to realize was that grace was sufficient and that it did not come from their sole adherence to the law, but by their fervor in faith. 
And I can pause and preach right there for a moment because many of us get caught up in adhering to customs and traditions and we forget that there's nothing but the grace of God. Nothing but the favor of God, nothing but the mercy of God that can grant us the heaven that we hope for. Because of this ill understanding of Jesus Christ, we present a Savior whose grace is only available to some. But I came by here to let somebody know today that we serve a God whose love is greater than the law. We serve a God whose loyalty is granted in grace. And it doesn't matter who you've been or who you've become or who you want to be. If you put your faith in God, God will do the rest. And if you're trying to lead a life of faith, trusting that it's on the way, I've got a few things I want to help you to give to help you get through this day. Can I give you the first point? The first thing that you must come to understand when you know that it's on the way is that you can't be exhausted in your efforts to excel. You can't be exhausted in your efforts to excel. See, if we look closely at the text, Paul inclines the church at Galatia to not get weary in doing good. Or to make it simple, don't get tired of doing the right thing. And I love the way that Paul addresses this community at Galatia because he forewarns them of the missteps that may happen when you lead a life of faith. And we can pause together on this morning because this is Children's Sunday. And I implore you that we as adults have a responsibility to guide our young people in a way that raises them aware of the potholes that may be in the roads that could give them flat tires on their journeys in life. We, we must let them know that they will face the world that ain't that nice. We must let them know that we've had our ups and downs. We must tell them the truth. The truth about what we've been through. Well, church, if we're not honest to them, then our future is in jeopardy. And we will have ourselves to blame. Paul says, do not be weary. And I think this is important on this Sunday morning. Because if we investigate the Greek translation of the word ekakeo, it is defined as being weary, spiritless, exhausted, or as one translator put it, relaxed. And I think that's a good place to stop this morning because the reason that many of us have not seen the change that we want to see in the church is because many of us who profess the name of God have fallen into a stagnated state that I called relaxed Christianity. We find ourselves no longer striving in faith. And what happens so often is that we lose sight of purpose because it seems that the standards of faith that we are upholding pushes us to a limit that forces us to question the validity when it's applied to our lives. We're tired of producing on a job that hasn't promoted us. We're tired of practicing hard at a sport when we're not getting in the game. Uh, we're tired of studying hard and not reaching our potential. Uh, we're tired of following the rules while watching others get over. We're tired of believing and not seeing breakthroughs. We're tired of praying and not feeling empowered, but I came to encourage you on this morning that you cannot get weary in doing good but rather transform your weariness into worship that glorifies God. I'll say it again, you may have missed it. We cannot get weary in good doing, but transform that weariness into worship that glorifies the almighty God that we serve. And is there anybody in this place that's thankful that we have the fortitude to be faithful when you know it's on the way? Can I give you the next point? See, the next thing that you must realize when it's on the way is that all that you were supposed to acquire will come at an appointed allotment. All that you are supposed to acquire will come at an appointed allotment. 
The Pauline voice in this text is building upon the message that he is illustrating in verses 7 and 8, which engages the concept of reaping and sowing, and as it pertains to the spiritual life of the community at Galatia and their relationship with God. See, Paul is suggesting that it is necessary for us as Christians to understand what grounds we are sowing into. And that's why he says, if you're sowing sow into the flesh, you will reap corruption. But when you sow in the spirit, you will have everlasting life. We've got to sow ourselves in the firm foundations of God, my brothers and sisters. See, when you sow yourself in the Father, you can expect that all that you sowed will come to fruition. And it, it, it will come to fruition in that season. And I can pause right there this morning because there may be somebody in this place who's been patiently waiting for God to deliver. And they have been waiting for their season of favor, but I'm telling you, it's on the way. Somebody in here need to be reminded that God's grace is still sufficient. Somebody here needed to be reminded that God might is still powerful. Somebody in here needed to be reminded that they may have come to a place where they've been lost, but God can still find you. Somebody needs to be reminded that we still serve an on-time God. But I came to encourage somebody to hold on because it's on the way. Tell your neighbor it's on the way. But, but, but what happens so often, my brothers and sisters, it's not that we stop believing. But what happens is we get tired of waiting on God. We get tired of waiting on God. And we've restricted God to fit into the timelines of our expectancies. And when it doesn't happen in our time, when it doesn't happen in our frameworks, uh, what happens is that we charge God interest and expect him to pay up. We act like God owes us something. We know how we can become. We only start fasting to force a blessing. We know how we can become. We only start praying when problems arise. We, we know how we can become. We start to act all sanctified as if God doesn't know who we really are. And we find ourselves uh, fooling ourselves to believe in this sudden spiritual inclination that places God in a situation of ultimatum. But I came out here to remind you that God's word never returns void. And that if you're patient, all that you have sown in the spirit will eventually come to pass. However, you must realize that God has a plan for you and in your season, you will harvest it. But you got to know that God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. God's timing is not our timing and we can't force God to do anything. But we must believe that he can deliver. Uh, looking at me a little blank. Uh, recently I was watching a movie uh, that was a biopic of Steve Jobs. We all know Steve Jobs, the movie Jobs, uh, the, 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 the founder of the company Apple. Half of y'all have iPhones in here now. And, and Jobs uh, was arguably uh, produced, and he's arguably produced one of the greatest inventions in human history. And as I was watching this Steve Jobs uh, movie earlier this week, uh, I was watching a portion of a scene where he was developing his company. And he was in a business meeting negotiation. And the terms of production of his small company were being challenged. And in this conversation, the businessman looked to Jobs and said that uh, your number that we want to offer you seems impossible for you to produce. So I'm going to give you this opportunity if you can deliver. Jobs looked at this man dead in the eyes and he says, not if I can deliver, but when I deliver. 
And I don't know who I'm preaching to on the day, but I just need a few testifying saints who can speak to the fact that we have a when I deliver God. A when I deliver God who can still deliver on time in business. When I was broke, God delivered. When I was sick, God delivered. When I was depressed, God delivered. When I was lonely, God delivered. When I was unemployed, God delivered. When I was abused, God delivered. When I overdosed, God delivered. When I was stressed, God delivered. When I was tired, God delivered. When it seemed like all hope is gone, God delivered. But I just need about two or three of you that can give God some praise. Because when you do the valuation of your life, you can report that God still delivers. Tell your neighbor, God delivered me. And I just came to let you know that God has a particular punctual plan that gives purpose to your life. But you've got to know that it's on the way. I'm about done, church. Can I give you the last point? Because when you recognize that it's on the way, then you must be sure that there's no desire to surrender in the midst of your situation. When you recognize that it's on the way, you must be sure that there's no desire to surrender in your situation. Uh, to make it simple, my brothers and sisters, we just can't give up. Uh, we must realize that when we sow seeds in the spirit, there will still be thorns to remove. When we sow seeds in the spirit, there'll still be a thicket to tear through. Uh, when, when we sow seeds in the spirit, there'll still be some weeds to pull up. Uh, when we sow seeds in the spirit, there'll still be some stones to overturn. When, when we sow seeds in the spirit, there'll still be some storms. There'll still be some barren seasons. There'll still be some droughts. Uh, we will still face the enemy that is trying to sift and devour all that we sow. But I declare that the devil is a liar in this place today and that all that came to defeat you can be overcome by devotion and sheer will. But what happens to many of us is that we do not have the spiritual sustenance to maintain us when our spiritual seeds are being sown and they begin to struggle. But I wanted to let you know that you can't give up now. Now, you can't give up now because you've come too far from where God has brought you. I came to encourage somebody because all that you need that God has always provided. I, I came to encourage somebody that greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. I, I came to encourage somebody that no weapon formed against you shall prosper and that you're still more than conquerors. I came to encourage somebody that you can't surrender because it's on the way. I, I said I was done. Can I push you a little further? Here we go. For, for you know that it's on the way because everything that you've been through has prepared you for how God is trying to prosper you. I'll say it again. Everything that you've been through has prepared you for how God is trying to prosper you. Uh, see, see, what I am suggesting is that the Pauline voice in this verse it's trying to convey through the illustration of sowing and reaping that the process of growth in God necessitates obstacles and adversity if you're going to attain what God has given you to aspire for. I'll say it again. In looking at this illustration, every process of growth in God necessitates you going through some adversity going through some obstacles, dealing with some trials and some tribulations if we're to attain what we aspire. Uh, I still think it's missing. Uh, when, when I was younger, digging overs, I wanted to be a scientist. I know. I wanted to be a scientist, and, and, and amongst many things, but I had this keen interest in science. And I remember one of my grade school teachers telling our class the story of Thomas Edison. We know Thomas Edison, inventor of the light bulb. And the story goes like this. Uh, 
Thomas Edison was a young hearing impaired boy. And many of his teachers labeled him as stupid, unteachable. And even as a child, he accidentally burnt down the family barn. It didn't get better for Thomas. Thomas Edison grew up to be a young man and was fired from his first job working at the railroad company because a train derailed because he wasn't paying attention. Even after Thomas began his career as an inventor, his work earned no recognition. Uh, even the British Parliament in 1878 describes Edison's inventions as unworthy of attention and practical application. But when they asked Thomas Edison, Reverend Brown, one of the most transformational inventors in modernity, they asked him uh, in his later years, how did you get to your role of success? They said, uh, how did you maneuver the detours and the roadblocks of success? Uh, Thomas Edison looked to the report. He said, uh, the thing is, I never failed once. But success just happened to be a 2,000 step process. You may have missed it. He said, I, I never failed once. But success just happened to be a 2,000 step process. And I'm just thankful that I'm in the place where I got a couple of 2,000 step saints who can testify that they never failed once. But God's favor made this a 2,000 step process towards salvation. And they can testify that what God has for me is for me. But I'm thankful, church, and over 2,000 years ago, the people asked God uh, and said, we need a savior. God said to his people, uh, because you've had faith in me and you sought my face, it's on the way. So God made an appointment on a Friday for God, Jesus to go up on a cross. They stretched him wide on Friday, put nails in his hands, nails in his feet put holes in his sides and a crown of thorn around his head. The people were wondering, uh, God, how is it on the way? He went down to a grave on Friday night, stayed in a grave all night Friday night, stayed in that grave all night Saturday night. The people got weary. Uh, they, they couldn't wait no more. They wondered, well, God, is it coming? Is it still on the way? He fought death all night Friday, fought it all night Saturday. The people wanted to give up on him. They wanted to give up on God. But I came by here to tell you, God said it's on the way. Because early one Sunday morning, early one Sunday morning, early one Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hands and said, hold on, help is on the way, deliverance is on the way, success is on the way, healing is on the way, hope is on the way, power is on the way, love is on the way, peace is on the way, salvation is on the way. I said, Jesus, say, I'm here and I'm here for you to say so hold on hold on hold on hold on hold on cuz help it's on the way don't you give up right now cuz it's on the way don't get weary in here it's on the way don't like you're losing because it's on the way all of your failures erase them because Christ came all of your joys rejoice because he's here is there anybody in this church today said is there anybody in this church that's thankful that God brought Jesus and our salvation My brothers and sisters, don't give up. Don't get weary in doing good. Just keep pushing. Just keep fighting. 
hold on. Because whatever God has placed over your life, it's on the way. <laughs>